quick introduction and then we'll move straight into the talk. So good evening or morning, wherever it is you're coming from, as Andy rightly says, uh, to today's talk. My name is Richard McKenzie and I'll be co-hosting with uh, Dr. Nick Bird at the University of Illinois. Um, just a quick note to say that this is the sixth talk, I believe, in the, in the series, this mini series of invited lectures on integrated nutrition and exercise physiology and metabolism. Today, we are joined by Dr. Chris Fry and Dr. Kevin Marech. Given um, we have two speakers tonight, I will offer up just a brief introduction to each of these, these guys before moving into the, the talk. So to, Dr. Chris, uh, Christopher Fry is a um, tenure associate press professor at the Department of Athletic Training and Clinical Nutrition at the University of Kentucky. Chris completed his PhD in biomedical sciences at the University Test at Texas Medical Branch and did his postdoctoral training in muscle physiology at the University of Kentucky in 2014. Dr. Kevin Marach is a senior um, postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Physical Therapy in the Center of Muscle Biology at the University of Kentucky. Also, they, I believe they share an office. Um, so Kevin completed his master's degree in exercise physiology from James Madison University in 2011 and before doing his PhD at Ball, uh, Ball State University in 2015. Both Chris and Kevin will be delivering a combined talk on what I think is a really interesting title, calling out, fusing in, supporting capillarization, satellite cell and their roles in muscle um, hypertrophy. Just before I pass you over to today's speakers, um, just a quick bit of admin, if you can um, turn your audio and videos off. And if you've got any questions, please like before use the Zoom uh, chat feature on this, um, this application. And I'll do my best to put them to the tonight's speakers after their talk. Uh, a quick reminder that the talk will be available on YouTube. Um, so you can catch up on anything you want to later on. And so without further um, delay, I'll pass you over to today's speakers. Thank you for the introduction, Richard, Nick. Thanks for the invitation to present some of our recent data. Um, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. I hope everyone is staying healthy and safe. And uh, we're excited to kind of present some recent data from our labs. Can everyone see the slides? Yeah, we can see it. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, sorry, Chris. Fantastic. <laughs> so, let's see. All right. Uh, for the format of today's presentation, we're going to start out with a bit of background on satellite cells and their role in muscle adaptation. And we'll focus on some recent clinical studies from our lab exploring fiber type specific roles for satellite cells and hypertrophy as well as the intersection of satellite cells and capillaries as they pertain to muscle growth in older adults, and then how we can utilize novel mouse models to kind of further delineate the role of satellite cell and exercise-induced adaptation prior to wrapping up. Skeletal muscle is a very unique multinucleated cell type known for its kind of robust adaptability. It's a very plastic tissue and responds extremely well to loading and it recovers uh, well from injury and much of this inherent plasticity has been attributed to satellite cells, the muscle resident stem cell. Satellite cells were discovered um, almost 60 years ago in muscle. They occupy this unique anatomical location residing outside of the sarcolemma or plasma membrane, but within the basement membrane of muscle fibers. And it was due to this sort of peripheral localization along a fiber's edge that led to the, the moniker satellite cell, as the term was, term was coined uh, so many years ago. And you can see in the representative immunohistochemical image, you know, outside of dystrophin showing the sarcolemma, but within laminin, identifying the basement membrane. This is just the niche where satellite cells reside. And even though they are intimately associated with their muscle fibers, they are an autonomous cell population and they serve as the primary source of new, myonu new, new myonuclei in postnatal muscle. Satellite cells are often associated strongly with their expression of the transcription factor PAC7. And PAC7 has key roles 
and regulating myogenic potential, the myogenic regulatory program, as well as maintaining satellite cell quiescence. In most instances in healthy muscle, satellite cells are very quiescent and it's only when the muscle is challenged via exercise, injury, or other insult that they initiate an activation program. And in addition to kind of serving as a, a tool to identify satellite cells, PAC-7 and other transcription factors associated with satellite cells and the myogenic program, such as MyoD or MIF-5, have served to help generate novel genetic models whereby satellite cell abundance and the expression of specific factors within satellite cells can be genetically manipulated using animal models. Following injury, satellite cells undergo a very well-described and well-defined process. Um, they undergo dramatic expansion very quickly after injury, proliferating to a significant degree, and then they can initiate a differentiation program whereby myoblast, myogenic progenitor cells, or the daughters of activated satellite cells can fuse into existing myofibers or fuse together to support de novo fiber formation. Some great work that came out about 10 years ago almost from four independent labs utilized some conditional depletion models um, whereby satellite cells are depleted in mouse muscle. These animals were subjected to injury and it was shown very eloquently that satellite cells are required for muscle regeneration. These studies utilize both supraphysiologic and more translationally relevant injury models and show that in the absence of satellite cells, when they are depleted from muscle, the muscle cannot mount a robust regenerative response and recover from injury. Turning back towards more exercise-mediated adaptations and hypertrophy, the myonuclear domain theory is, is very commonly tied to how muscle adapts during a growth stimulus. Skeletal muscle being a multinucleated cell type, you have a variety of myonuclei along the length of an individual muscle fiber or cell, and each one of these myonuclei is thought to govern a set amount of that cytosolic volume. Some seminal work showed that myonuclear gene products actually remain fairly well localized to their myonucleus of origin, providing support for this whereby geographically speaking, each myonucleus can govern that set area of the fiber. The myonuclear domain is most commonly expressed as a volume or area per myonucleus. During hypertrophy, fibers undergo you know, a very well characterized increase in cytosolic volume, quote unquote hypertrophy or growth. And during this process to maintain a relatively constant myonuclear domain, it's thought that satellite cells fuse in contributing new myonuclei to kind of keep that myonuclear domain relatively constant and preserved during adaptation. Historically, satellite cell fusion was thought to be an integral part of the hypertrophic process. Studies undertook low-level irradiation in rodent models, initiating DNA damage that would serve then to block cellular proliferation and in theory satellite cell fusion and then expose these animals to various growth stimuli. It was shown in these studies that following irradiation muscles did not undergo a hypertrophic response and it was thought that per se due to the inability of satellite cells to accomplish their fusogenic role the muscle was unable to grow. While informative these studies were plagued by the effects of irradiation um, on multiple cell types, various mononuclear cells, as well as myonuclei in the muscle itself. And so it's difficult to draw definitive conclusions about the specific role of satellite cells when employing these models. Other genetic models have looked at knocking out myostatin or overexpressing AKT and shown that with these genetic models, growth can be accomplished in the absence of satellite cell fusion. Hypertrophy in these animal models did not, uh, was not associated with myonuclear accrual, speaking to perhaps an ability of the muscle during non-overload, non-contractile stimulation to grow in the absence of satellite cell activity. More recently, further genetic models have employed an approach whereby satellite cells can be conditionally and genetically depleted from skeletal muscle. Most of these studies employ a mouse term, the PAC-7 DTA, and this model allows 
for a drug to be given to animals that leads to the depletion of satellite cells following a specific genotype whereby satellite cells can be very strongly depleted, upwards of 95, 98% in muscle. And these animals can be subjected to various growth stimuli to study the necessity of satellite cells in that growth response. And work from our lab has shown that in the shorter term, muscles are able to mount a robust hypertrophic response in the absence of satellite cells, but more longer term mechanical overload for periods of around eight weeks or so, the muscle grew but to an attenuated extent as compared to more wild type similar or satellite cell replete animals. So in theory, there is an ability of satellite cell depleted muscle to grow, but to a lesser extent than animals with a full complement of their satellite cells. However, more recently work has explored, further explored this, this relationship. And there's been a little bit more controversy in the field where other groups have shown a mitigation of the growth response using a similar genetic approach to short-term hypertrophy. And other groups have shown by genetically depleting myomakers, specifically in satellite cells, it also led to a mitigation of hypertrophy using similar mechanical overload models in animals. So the consensus right now is it's not clear cut as to a necessary or requisite role for satellite cells in the hypertrophic adaptation of muscle and that leads to some of the studies we're going to further present today to try and tease this apart. As we move back into more clinically relevant using exercise training as a growth stimulus in human participants, a multitude of studies have shown dramatic expansion of satellite cells following both acute and chronic exercise studies. And this expansion, at least in a chronic um, manner, is associated with myonuclear accrual, i.e. satellite cell fusion contributing new myonuclei to fibers during exercise training. Some eloquent work from Marcus Bamman's group actually tied as well the efficacy of that hypertrophic response to the ability to activate satellite cells and contribute new myonuclei. Human participants who underwent the most robust um, myonuclear accrual were the ones who experienced the greatest hypertrophic outcomes following resistance exercise training, linking satellite cells to exercise adaptation. And so kind of culmination of what these data show us has led to a few key questions we sought to explore further, and that's trying to understand whether or not there is flexibility in the myonuclear domain, and how does fiber type influence satellite cell activity? Is there a differential regulation of satellite cells in the different fiber types? How does that play into exercise-induced adaptation? To start, one of the first studies we undertook um, explored response to endurance exercise in sedentary adults. So these adults underwent 12 weeks of endurance exercise on a cycle ergometer. You can see the parameters in the diagram on the slide with biopsies collected both pre and post training. We saw in these participants, even though this was an exercise modality, a modest level of hypertrophy in both type one and type two fibers. The degree of hypertrophy was relatively similar between the two fiber types, about a 12% increase in mean fiber cross-sectional area. We sought then to characterize, to identify and define how satellite cells interact with their fibers on a fiber type specific basis. And so utilizing the immunohistochemical image you see on your slide, you can see we were able to delineate in biopsies either type one fibers stained pink or unstained black type two fibers. Identifying the basal lamina in green with laminin and satellite cells as PAC7 positive we can identify which fiber, a type one or a type two, a specific satellite cell is associated with. And from these analyses, we saw an expansion um, in the satellite cell pool specific to type one fibers. So there's a relatively dramatic increase in satellite cell abundance only in those type one fibers. And this was associated with myonuclear accretion. So it appear the Proliferation of satellite cells ultimately led to their fusion in some of these type 1 fibers as well as myonuclear density was increased in type 1 fibers. We did not see observable changes in both satellite cell abundance or myonuclear density in type 2 fibers following this, this exercise program. And so you know, from this, we're 
able to kind of think about differential response and it would appear that the more oxidative type one fibers underwent satellite cell expansion, myonuclear accretion, kind of in a, a differential manner than their type two more glycolytic counterparts, speaking to a potential fiber type specific difference in satellite cell requirement during hypertrophy. Now the hypertrophy was similar in both fiber types but it's been shown that type one fibers have relatively greater metabolic activity and rates of protein synthesis. And so during a growth response, it may be that there is a greater need to fuse in satellite cells, adding genetic material to these growing fibers to support the increased demands type one fibers have. And this may then speak to a differential response on a fiber type basis. Type two fibers may have myonuclei that are more responsive, that are able to compensate better to increase their own transcriptional output in the absence of satellite cell mediated myonuclear accrual. Does this then speak to greater flexibility per se in the type two fiber myonuclear domain? And then to try to answer this question, we go back to an animal model. Uh, this work was performed by Tyler Kirby, who's now a postdoc at Cornell University. And he utilized the similar PAC-7 DTA animal that allows for the conditional depletion of satellite cells. And he compared both satellite cell replete or wild type, as well as the PAC-7 DTA mice to two weeks of mechanical overload. This is accomplished by a surgery whereby certain muscles are removed from the hind limb, leaving behind the plantaris. This surgical model of growth induces robust hypertrophy in the plantaris in a relatively short time, allowing us to kind of concisely study those hypertrophic changes in an animal model. Now, in, in mice, the plantaris is a largely glycolytic muscle comprised primarily of type two fibers. Tyler sought to assay basic global transcription of these animals and he did so via the incorporation of a uridine analog. Ethanolyluridine was given to these mice in the hours leading into tissue collection at the end of their two week overload to identify changes in transcriptional capacity due to this hypertrophic stimulus. So in the more wild type associated animals, we see our traditional satellite cell fusion, myonuclear accrual that accompanies the hypertrophic response. The PAC-7 DTA animals underwent a similar degree of hypertrophy, but in the absence of myonuclear accrual due to the lack of satellite cells. And you can see in the image here, EU incorporation is seen in red and localizes very strongly to myonuclei within the plantaris. Looking specifically at EU incorporation on a per myonucleus basis, animals depleted of their satellite cells show far greater incorporation of this uridine analog and then total uridine labeled, total EU labeled RNA in those fibers was dramatically elevated in the PAC-7 DTA mice, showing here that it would appear in the absence of myonuclear accrual, these type two fibers, the plantaris muscle in particular, has an ability to increase its global transcriptional output, that perhaps it has a greater ceiling, if you will, to accommodate the increased demands placed on the fibers during this growth stimulus. Now, tying this back into humans, the you know, fiber type, type one, type two, it's not a direct translation murine to human muscle, but from this we can start to draw conclusions about differences per se in type one versus type two muscle fiber growth. There has been study, other work in humans that does show some flexibility in the myonuclear domain. Certain um, participants in, in published literature have shown robust growth, i.e. greater than 26% increases in fiber area that was not accompanied by myonuclear accrual. So the myonuclear domain underwent a dramatic expansion. And on the flip side too, other studies have shown that in the absence of hypertrophy following exercise training, myonuclear accrual does occur. So perhaps just a contraction-induced stimulus is enough to initiate fusion of myonuclei, fusion of satellite cells to contribute myonuclei, even in the absence of a robust growth response. And so these data question the rigidity or the flexibility, if you will, of the myonuclear domain and the necessity of satellite cell fusion to support growth. Looking into 
aging muscle adaptation, as was covered very well last week, aging induces a decline in muscle function mass, termed sarcopenia, that does preferentially affect type two fibers. And this is associated with also a decline, a reduced abundance and activity of satellite cells. And so looking at data from our lab over the past several years, just a cross-sectional analysis of satellite density, satellite cell density, you can see that there exists a pretty negative correlation across the lifespan with fewer satellite cells available to contribute to muscle adaptation in older individuals. Understanding mechanisms and means by which satellite cells may facilitate growth and represent a therapeutic target to enhance exercise efficacy, especially in populations challenged by muscle loss, such as older adults, Recent work has shown that there is an interaction or intersection between satellite cells and capillaries within muscle. The proximity or distance of satellite cells to their nearest capillary has been shown to facilitate satellite cell activation and likely supports exercise adaptation. And this distance in aging muscle has been shown to be greater, and this could lead to impediments in satellite cell activity, the inability to activate properly following exercise due to a reduction in growth hormone delivery, nutrients, oxygen, what have you from the capillaries, and therefore perhaps impede muscle adaptability or response to exercise. And on the flip side, it's been shown that differentiating satellite cells are pro-angiogenic in and of themselves, secreting growth factors such as vascular endothelial growth factor that would promote angiogenesis or capillary remodeling. So it appears that there's this two-way street arrangement whereby satellite cells and capillaries interact to support muscle adaptation as it relates to exercise. And so we sought to determine various cellular adaptation to resistance exercise in older adults. And this work was largely published in two recent papers from the lab, both in the Journal of Applied Physiology as well as Experimental Gerontology. And this work was conducted by Dr. Tatiana Moro, a postdoc fellow who is now faculty at the University of Padova in Italy. We had older sedentary adults undergo 12 weeks of progressive resistance exercise training with biopsies collected both pre and post training. We isolated from these biopsies a portion of single fibers to understand volumetric changes in the fibers themselves. And we noted robust increases in fiber volume from these isolated fibers, about 42% increase and surprisingly, this was not associated with an increased density of myonuclei in the fibers. So this led to an expansion of the myonuclear domain within these isolated fibers, but it should be noted that these fibers were collected irrespective to fiber type. So we're unable from these data to draw definitive conclusions on differential requirements based on type one or type two. Looking at the cross-sectional analyses, the histological um, biopsy pieces where we could denote fiber type status, we saw that the hypertrophic outcomes we observed in the single fibers would appear to be largely driven by changes in type two fiber cross-sectional area as those fibers underwent a far more robust growth response than the more modest increase in size we saw in the type one fibers. Surprisingly though, we did see myonuclear accrual in these type, five, type one fibers, even in the absence of robust growth Speaking again to potential this, this contraction-induced satellite cell fusion, adding myonuclei even without a, a robust growth response. And this would speak to what we observe as a differential regulation of the myonuclear domain based on a type one or type two basis, with type one fibers actually showing a decrease in their myonuclear domain, type two fibers showing the opposite, a, a subtle increase based on hypertrophy and minor myonuclear accrual. And we did not capture a significant elevation in satellite cell abundance associated with either fiber type here, but it would appear that satellite cells, at least on a type one fiber basis, were well activated to support the myonuclear accrual that we did observe. And so looking at the intersection of capillaries and satellite cells, the distance between those two cell types was influenced by resistance training in our studies and the distance specifically decreased in relation to type two fiber associated satellite cells. And this would speak to perhaps a remodeling of the satellite cell capillary niche 
to support growth in the absence of satellite cell mediated fusion, an interesting phenomenon to occur in that satellite cells did not actually fuse into a observable degree in these fibers. And this speaks to further evidence that's really kind of spoken to capillaries as a key determinant, muscle capillarization to support fiber growth during exercise adaptation. So looking retrospectively at these same studies, we stratified them into their pre-resistance exercise training capillary density. So this was done from their pre-training biopsies, just kind of dichotomizing subjects into those with relatively low or relatively high capillarization indices to see if there was an appreciable difference in their outcomes to resistance exercise training following the, the study. And we saw that subjects with a higher pre-resistance training capillarization actually underwent a far greater degree of hypertrophy uh, uh, seen in a multitude of ways, just type two fiber cross-sectional area, leg lean mass, appendicular muscle mass. So a variety of measures showed a far greater hypertrophic response in those high capillary trainers compared to their lower pre-training capillary counterparts. Importantly too, we see that protein synthesis rates were elevated in the subjects with greater pre-training capillarization levels, speaking to cellular mechanisms supported perhaps by capillary delivery of amino acids or other growth factors to increase rates of protein synthesis and thus support the hypertrophy that we observe. We did show though that in those lower capillary subjects, the ones that started training with lower density, that the resistance exercise training supported an increase in their muscle capillarization. And this has been shown by other groups as well, and it speaks to perhaps a temporal relationship whereby capillarization increases may precondition and precede muscle growth during exercise training. Getting to a certain threshold capillary density may be needed for optimal muscle growth and understanding where those points are are key and that we can develop interventions to kind of target decrements in capillary density to better prime human participants to respond more strongly to exercise. For that, I'm gonna to pass to Dr. Kevin Murak to take over on some mouse models. Hello, everybody. I'm Kevin. I uh, just quickly want to thank Dr. Fry for calling me up from the minor leagues to pitch the final inning of this talk here and also for uh, Dr. McKenzie and Bird for going along with that. Uh, I just want to talk to you guys a little bit about mouse models today. Um, so Dr. Fry and I both come from a resistance exercise background and from that I mean uh, we're humans that like to resistance exercise uh, and all of our you know studies prior to our postdoctoral work were human resistance exercise uh, type studies. My dissertation was, Chris has published widely in that area. So um, we come from that human resistance exercise background. But um, once we arrived at the University of Kentucky and started working here um, as postdocs, I'm still a postdoc, um, we kind of realized the power of these models and how much we can learn from them and how they can complement the human work in a very significant way and really make our understanding of muscle hypertrophy um, that much deeper. And uh, we kind of got into this uh, at Kentucky and continue to employ this in our research program. So the question I think a lot of people ask, they don't understand mouse models is why? Why, why do we use mouse models to, to study muscle growth? And there's a number of reasons. The first is mice are mammals and we're mammals, so that works out, that's good. Um, so there's that translatability there. Um, we have a high degree of control over experimental conditions, and that's really big. Uh, with, a, with a mouse study, for instance, you can control almost every aspect from the sense of the food they eat, uh, the time that they do different activities, how long they do them, even their sleeping. Like We can control essentially every aspect, which as a scientist is really wonderful because you want to kind of try and control as many conditions as possible when you're doing a study in order to answer your question. So specifically with studying muscle hypertrophy, um, Mites are also good because they have satellite cells, unlike some insect models where you're studying muscle growth and there aren't satellite cells. So there's that translatability to humans. Um, muscle fibers are actually structurally and functionally very similar to humans and adapt similarly to training. 
Uh, so if I showed you a uh, muscle fiber from a mouse and a human under a microscope, you wouldn't be able to discern the difference. They look essentially identical with the exception that a mouse fiber is maybe a little smaller. And so um, that's nice. And also when you do different manipulations with them to get the muscles to grow, um, all the classic adaptations will occur though. Muscle fibers will get larger. You'll see a transition in fiber type where a loss of type 2X fibers and a gain of type 2A fibers. So going from a faster to slower phenotype. Um, and also you'll see an increase in the number of myonuclei as well as an increase in the number of satellite cells. So they do respond quite similarly uh, to humans as well, which Chris has nicely outlined for us. And I'm gonna take a second here, because um, I think it's really important. Um, another advantage of mouse models is the exquisite control we have over mouse genetics. So in the last decade and even the last few years, there's been major advancements in how we're able to control various aspects of muscle uh, through genetic manipulations. And so um, in 2012, here at the University of Kentucky, uh, Dr. Esther is now at the University of Florida, but um, doctors John McCarthy, Charlotte Peterson, and Karen Esther developed a model called the HSA Mercury Mer. I won't get into the nuts and bolts of exactly how it works, but um, what I want you to understand about it though, is with this mouse model, what we're able to do is specifically delete a gene only in the muscle at a time that we designate. So for instance, let's say you ran a human resistance exercise study and you found some gene that goes up really uh, a large amount with human resistance exercise in your muscle samples. And now you wanna test whether or not that particular gene is actually important, whether it's an association or whether it's actually required for the hypertrophic response. What you can do is you can take this mouse, CH say MCM, and you can go and you can specifically delete that gene before you train the mouse and then have it go through its training and if the muscle still grows, and I guess it was just an association, but if it doesn't grow, then that tells you that that specific gene, that factor was necessary for growth. And then you can go in and interrogate further and figure out exactly what it's doing and you can get that mechanism, which is uh, really important for understanding uh, how muscle grows and for developing proper therapeutics. You wanna make sure the thing you're targeting is necessary. And then recently, um, another model was developed called the HSA RTTA which is um, similar but different. Essentially with this model, you can go in and we can deliver a compound to the mouse and then we can specifically turn on the gene that you want, your gene of interest um, for a period of time for as long as that compound is in the mouse's system. And so it gives you really tight control over overexpressing a specific gene. And that's really important too. So now you can do gain and loss of function studies. And so because of all of this, mouse models are extremely powerful tools for understanding how muscle adapts. And so we've been able to leverage this in our studies and are continuing to leverage this in order to gain this really deep understanding of muscle growth by combining it with our human studies and having a mouse component and the marriage of those is really very powerful. So let's say we want to undertake a, or a mouse resistance training study. What's classically been the approach for quote unquote resistance training a mouse, getting the mouse muscle to grow, is something called the synergist ablation. So I've made a little cartoon here and you can see this is um, a cartoon of the mouse hind limb. So this is the gastrocnemius muscles, the calf muscle essentially of the mouse. This is the gastrocnemius muscles here. This is the soleus muscle underneath. And then over here on the uh, medial side, which would be the medial side, um, is the plantaris muscle, which is a smaller muscle, but it contributes to um, plantar flexion and force production. For the, um, the mouse hind limb. And so what we do in order to get this plantaris muscle to grow, which is a prim primarily fast twitch muscle, what we do is we go in, we um, anesthetize the muscle, we put it under, anesthetize the mouse rather, we put it under, knock it out essentially, and then we can go in and cut out a portion of this gastrocnemius as well as the soleus muscle underneath, and then we sew the muscle back up, or sew, sew the mouse back up, and then we put them back in their cage and essentially we let them ambulate. And so what happens is once they wake up and start walking around, this smaller muscle has to adopt the role of what the larger muscles would do since they're not there anymore. And what you do is you elicit this compensatory overload response. So the muscle compensates and it has to become larger in order to fill the shoes and support the role that the gastrocnemius and soleus was playing. And so uh, it's a really powerful model. It has some advantages, which is that it's um, rapid and it's very, very robust. The muscle will a lot of times double in size within a couple of weeks. It's relatively simple to, this, to deploy once you um, use, or once you know how to do the surgery, you could do a whole study in a couple of days. You do the surgeries, you put the mice back in the cage, you come back one week, two weeks, eight weeks later, and then you harvest the tissue. And it's really great because you know you're gonna get hypertrophy and it's gonna be very significant. So you'd be able to study that, that process and it's very reliable. It's also been widely adopted. It's been employed in mouse for, since the 70s or so. 
And so there's a very uh, broad and deep body of literature on the synergistic ablation approach in mice as well as in rats. And so um, we know quite a lot about it at this point. So that's all really great. There are obviously some disadvantages to this. So uh, the first is that it's invasive. So we go in and we perform surgery. We cut out a portion of muscle. That's not something you typically do to a human to induce hypertrophy. So it kind of lacks a little bit of that translatable aspect. Um, it can elicit degeneration and regeneration and or fiber splitting, which are um, sometimes associated with um, more pathological type of responses and it isn't necessarily something that's associated with resistance exercise in humans per se. Um, it can cause, again, an extreme rate and magnitude of growth. Uh, the growth can ensue uh, very, very quickly and you may see a doubling in muscle mass over the course of a couple of weeks, which you wouldn't see with resistance exercise in humans. There's a general lack of specificity with the signal that's eliciting growth. So obviously there's tension on the muscle. Every time the mouse takes a step, so it's, it's loading the muscle, but it's also causing a stretch on the muscle. So that hypertrophy could come from a couple different places, a couple different stimuli, so to say. And so um, it's a, a little bit less specific. Um, it's a continual loading stimulus. Uh, it's not growth elicited by sets and reps as would happen with resistance training in humans. It's continuous. Every step the mouse takes is being loaded and there's no rest. Um, and it's not uh, reversible without more surgery or unloading. Uh, a popular approach, if you want to study something like detraining from the initial training, uh, you'd have to go in and surgically cut um, the nerve that's uh, innervating the plantaris. And so that's, again, not something you typically want to do in humans. Typically, if a human detrains, they just stop training. They don't um, de-innervate themselves. And so uh, for those reasons, the synergist ablation has some drawbacks. And so this is something that's been used in the field for a very long time, very well accepted but it does have these specific limitations that kind of prevent us from asking certain questions. And so um, we set out to sort of change this and try to develop a new resistance training-like stimulus for mice. And uh, this was actually uh, spearheaded by Dr. Corey Dungan, who's a postdoc with me here at the University of Kentucky, and he's the pioneer of power. He put the mice on the wheels. I was, helping them out with this. And um, we just kind of fortuitously discovered something really interesting. Um, when we tried to do this model, we tried to replicate um, a resistance training uh, model that already exists in the literature that doesn't work quite as well, but we kind of did it in a way that, um, that was different by accident and it ended up being more beneficial. So um, what we ended up doing is uh, putting mice in these wheel running cages but we uh, only put weight on one side of the wheel. So it was an asymmetric loading stimulus. Um, and we just did that out of convenience at the time, um, but it ended up being what we think is the secret sauce for why this works so well. Um, but we put the weight just on the one side, which is illustrated here. And uh, mice have a very high propensity for running. They like to run, they'll run quite a bit. But when we, un when we weighted the wheel in this asymmetric way, something kind of interesting happened. So hopefully this video is working for you all. You can see the mouse will start running, running, running. And they're going and they'll get up to get up to speed, but then they'll end up stumbling and have to stop. Like in that particular case, it actually went all the way around the wheel. Um, but then it stops and it starts again. And then it stops and it starts again. They'll just keep doing that all night. They're kind of stubborn little creatures. And so um, they're kind of doing sets and reps all night long because the weight is um, distributed in such a weird way that um, they can't get accustomed to it. But they'll just keep going back to it and then have to overcome the weight of the wheel, start it, and then they'll stop again. So again, kind of a sets and reps types of situation. And then we can load the wheel progressively over the course of eight weeks, much like you would with resistance training. And uh, we can get them up to 20% or more of their body weight, and they'll still run the same volume as there's no weight on the wheel. And so they'll do this high volume resistance training. And uh, it really works out well for us. And then other advantage is that uh, we can clip the wheel and stop it from turning. So then we can study detraining as well. And so um, I don't want you to get too bogged down. This is um, data from a paper that uh, Dr. Dungan and myself published last year. But I just want to illustrate here that um, you see significant hypertrophy and you see all the classic adaptations associated with resistance training resulting from this new power model. And so I just will focus down here at the bottom because this is a, an immunohistochemical cross-sectional image of the mouse plantaris. And what you see, this is an untrained uh, muscle and type 2A fibers are the green. So these are oxidative uh, in the mouse, but also um, fast twitch. And then 2X and 2B fibers are the red and the black and those are more glycolytic um, fast twitch. So you'll see that um, the plantaris muscle is composed of mostly these fast twitch fibers, but with power training, the muscle gets much, much, much bigger, as you can see. And also the muscle fibers get larger and you see a transition towards a more oxidative phenotype, which is similar to what you see with human resistance training. And then once you clip the wheel and let them just sit for three weeks or three months and not train anymore, 
the muscle goes back down to essentially what's more of a detrained phenotype or the untrained phenotype uh, before the training began. And so we can elicit hypertrophy without doing surgery, and then we can detrain the mice. And so this is a, just a very powerful way for us to study muscle adaptation and de-adaptation in the mouse. So uh, we saw an opportunity here. Uh, when we originally designed our studies, um, we weren't going to look at this per se, but then we decided, well, we have this detraining stimulus. Now we can answer this question that's sort of been lingering in the muscle field for quite some time. So um, back in 2010 and 2013, the Gunderson Laboratory developed this hypothesis, this idea about a cellular muscle memory of hypertrophy. So essentially, the idea goes like this. Let's say this is your muscle fiber before you're going to go to the gym and start resistance training. It's small. It doesn't have as many myonuclei. What happens when you start going to the gym is that you start activating satellite cells that usually will fuse into the muscle fiber and contribute myonuclei, new myonuclei, as uh, Dr. Fry illustrated before. And then what will happen is the muscle will get bigger and eventually you'll get to the trained state. So now you're well trained, you're, you know, you're strong, you're big, your muscle fibers are large and you have lots of myonuclei that were derived from the satellite cells. Well, let's say you run into a scenario where you need to stop training. Uh, either you got injured or you just got lazy. Uh, and so what would happen in this model, according to uh, the Gunderson Laboratory, is that your muscle fibers would get smaller, but you would maintain and keep the myonuclei that you initially gained. The thought is that the myonuclei you gain are permanent. And so if you were to start training again, let's say you got motivated and you want to go back to the gym, what would happen is that your muscle fiber would grow more quickly because you have the myonuclei already in the muscle. They're already on board. You didn't have to go through this whole process of adding new myonuclei from satellite cells. They were already there. And so you can hypertrophy more quickly. Now, the, the drawback of the, um, the model here, uh, it was developed using mice and rats, and it was, it was done with a surgical approach and followed by denervation, which again is not really quite like human resistance training and detraining, or it was done using anabolic steroids and then taking the anabolic steroids away. And so um, we actually have a new training detraining model that's kind of like human resistance exercise. So we thought, okay, well, we're going to look at the, try to ask this question in a more physiological translatable way. So what do we find? So I already showed you that the muscle got bigger, then it got smaller with training and detraining. So we looked at the number of myonuclei in the muscle as well. And we did this a couple different ways. We did um, some single fiber isolation, some immunohistochemistry, found the same result in both ways, that when you train, the number of myonuclei goes up, which is you know, something we would have expected. But then when you detrain, the number of myonuclei goes back down towards untrained levels. It's not quite down all the way at three months, but it's, it's significantly lower. So this would actually suggest that perhaps you lose myonuclei with detraining as opposed to keeping them permanently. And so um, this was published in 2019. And in that same year, um, the Gunderson Laboratory, in, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Dr. Nicholas Salander, uh, did a human study to kind of try and get at this as well. And so I'll just briefly describe the study design here. They had um, 19 subjects, uh, young college age type subjects, come in. And what they did is they took a resting biopsy. We'll just say for argument's sake, it was from the right leg, from one of the legs. It was unilateral training. So they took a, a biopsy sample. And then they trained these people rigorously for 10 weeks and got them so that their muscle was pretty well trained, then took a post-resistance training biopsy, and then detrained these same folks for 20 weeks, took a detrained state biopsy, and then trained them again for five weeks on this one leg, and then took a fourth biopsy, which is the retrained state biopsy, um, all from the, the vastus lateral laterals, the thigh muscle of the leg. And then their control was the opposite leg where they only did the retraining. And the thought was that this muscle that had trained previously would have gained the myonuclei from training and then would have detrained but kept the myonuclei and then grown more quickly as a consequence with the, with the retained myonuclei uh, during the retraining state. So that was the thought. But essentially the conclusion from their study was that um, there was quite a bit of variability in, um, in their 19 subjects. And also they concluded that, you know, on the whole, that there wasn't an increase in the number of myonuclei with the initial training, so that you can grow without the addition of myonuclei, which isn't that surprising to us, given what uh, Chris has, has touched on earlier. But um, they basically concluded that they weren't able to test their hypothesis because the whole group didn't see an increase in the number of myonuclei. But again, I said that they had some variability in their data and they actually published their raw data online, which was good because we were able to go in and interrogate that ourselves. And so what we ended up doing was we, um, we took their data and we asked the question, if you did experience an increase in the number of myonuclei, so if these subjects, um, if you picked out the subjects that did see a, an increase above baseline with the initial training, 
what happened? Did that number of myonuclei go back to baseline or did it stay high or did it go higher even? And we actually found um, the result from the humans that did experience an increased number of myonuclei with the training saw a reduction with detraining, which is entirely consistent with our mouse work and is actually consistent with a few other studies in humans that have since been published. And so it's looking to us that perhaps if there is a memory of previous resistance training in the muscle, a cellular memory, it maybe is not directly related to the number of myonuclei, at least in the long term. We think perhaps they're being lost in some way that we don't know yet. But there might be some other mechanisms, some other epigenetic mechanisms that are at play that could contribute to a muscle memory of previous adaptation. And so, um, and using both of these um, strategies here, we found they found essentially the same thing. So we feel reasonably confident that this is happening. And so um, that's where we're at right now. And hopefully, we'll have some more studies in the in the very near future that are going to help to um, kind of elucidate this muscle memory idea. And um, we're just going to keep at it with our mouse models and try to keep translating it to, uh, to human work. So, thanks. Great, thank you very much both. Very um, uh, lovely talk, very comprehensive. Um, great to see so many different approaches uh, being used in your lab. You're doing some really, really clever work. Um, just gonna uh, push over, unless you want to do any acknowledgement. Sorry, Chris, I've just been your, your last slide come up. Nope, yeah, it's dead. not a problem at all. We just definitely want to acknowledge all the work of postdocs, grad students, and everyone else in the lab that's contributed to these projects. A list of names here, pictures of our labs, as well as acknowledge the funding sources that support our work. I think that'll do it. Thank you. Great. Thanks again, guys. So I've got a, a few questions. Um, I, I missed a bit of your talk, so I'm going to go back and listen to it as I was dealing with some, some admin and some um, people asking questions for it. But I've got a question from, um, from Dan Moore. Um, I'm going to try and bring him on line. Give me a second. Bear with me. Um, so he can ask it himself if, if at all possible. Dan, I've just asked you to unmute if you want to come on. Um, there we go. Yes. Hi. Thank you, Richard. And uh, thank you, Chris, uh, Dr. Fry, for Fantastic talk. You guys do some really interesting work in this space. Uh, I was interested to, to see some of the results you've done, the work you've done on the impact of acrylarization and perhaps baseline capillarization on the efficacy of, of resistance exercise. And so is this, uh, are we at a point where we should be looking at uh, designing uh, rehab programs that may enhance capillarization before we start trying to increase muscle growth? Um, or is it also something that might suggest uh, exercise modalities that might target both, such as uh, light load, high effort resistance exercise might be kind of an optimal one size fits all? A fantastic questions. Thanks, Dan. And you kind of get at the, the crux of some of our current work where we're really trying to explore those questions. Is there a need or, or, or would it be more efficacious to imply some sort of aerobic preconditioning, if you will, prior to the onset of, you know, more traditional resistance training, or as you say, is a more combinatorial approach better to, to obtain the kind of outcomes we seek to with uh, um, loading of the muscle during these training studies? It's, I think from our work and the other work, the, the fantastic work from Gianni Parisi's group and several others around the world, you know, trying to, to understand, you know, if there is a threshold, you know, of capillarization that would optimize muscle, muscle growth at the onset of progressive training, it's difficult to kind of arrive at that point yet. Um, we're currently moving forward to try and understand if, you know, a preconditioning program does allow for more optimal muscle growth during traditional resistance training. Um, as to whether that is the best approach, I, I can't speak to that yet, but I do think that's an exciting area to explore, and it would appear that this is a modifiable cellular determinant within muscle that you know really could improve outcomes to resistance training, and so it's something we're very interested in exploring further. Thank you. I look forward to seeing that work. Thank you, Dan. Um, I got a, a quick question from Peter Watt. I'm just going to scroll up and find it. Sorry for the, the delay. There's quite a few questions coming through for you, Chris and Kevin. Just as I try to find it, I want to pick a, a bone of contention with, 
with Kevin on his um, comment on detraining, either you become injured or lazy, and um, you didn't mm. consider childcare in that, uh, in that detraining effect. I think you need to employ that in your models. <laughs> yeah, that was a little insensitive here, Adam, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, from Peter Watt, um, doesn't the different response of type one and type two fibers in terms of satellite cell recruitment but both with uh, hypertrophy lead to a re rejection of the nuclear domain hypothesis. Has anyone looked at the Wnt beta ketamine, uh, ketamine or hippo pathways? Specifically in the context of fiber type or binuclear fusion. So uh, let's see. I know people have. I mean, uh, when I think hippo, I think Henning Wacker Hage, and uh, he's uh, he's done a lot of work with uh, with the hippo pathway, specifically in the context of fiber type specificity. I'm less sure. Um, I know. Well, John McCarthy has done work with Wynn and beta catenin, but it had less to do with um, myonuclear fusion and more to do with ribosome biogenesis in the context of muscle fibers and how the Wynn beta catenin pathway plays into that. But um, if, the, if it's out there, which it may be, uh, I'm not accessing it in my mind at the moment, but um, I would, if you're interested in wind beta catenin or specifically the hippo pathway, I would direct you towards uh, Henning Wacker Hage's work. Great. Th thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm glad you got the answer uh, to that question after I, I butchered the delivery. I've um, got a, a question from Alex. Um, Alex, you should be able to join us online. Uh, yes, thank you uh, very much, Richard. That was a really interesting talk. Uh, this question is for Kevin. Um, earlier this year, uh, Timothy Schneider's published a review paper, and he said that there's currently no consensus within the scientific community on the existence of muscle memory by myonuclear permanence in human skeletal muscle. And your work and the power model I know is uh, um, <clears throat> involved in showing that these myonuclei can be lost after resistance training and you're in your mouse model uh, these myonuclei are being lost but in the Gunderson lab when a synergistic ablation is being used these myonuclei seem to be permanent so do you what do you think the reason the difference is between uh, in your studies and power training the myonuclei lost whereas in synergistic ablation they seem to be permanent do you think it's to do with synergistic ablation being more intensive and so the myonuclei being permanent in the muscle might be more beneficial long term and maybe there's some sort of signal gain put across from this intensity of this form of hypertrophy that then makes those myonuclei last longer whereas the power model is maybe less intensive um, and so the myonuclei could be lost and then that would not be a disadvantage long term and somehow that signal is being carried forth as to how long these myonuclei then last. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for a great talk. That's a, that's a great question. You actually raised some really interesting points, things that I haven't quite thought about myself with, there is, with the standard ablation being so intense. So is that lingering signal greater than what you'd be with regular sub training or something like power? That's a really provocative hypothesis and it's certainly possible. And I don't mean to be so definitive with our conclusions. Um, I only had a limited amount of time and I would have loved to give a whole talk on just that topic because there's actually a wealth of information on it and more that's emerging and even more that we've developed in our lab that's in review. And so there's a, there's a lot going on with um, muscle memory, myonuclei, the different models. Um, as you say, I think your, um, your idea that the standard distillation being more intense perhaps could play into perhaps the, the discrepant or not entirely congruent results between ours and the Gunderson laboratory. Another possibility um, is with the uh, synergist ablation when you go to denervate, there are interesting biological things that happen with denervation as well as the model to induce atrophy. I've seen evidence where um, if you denervate the muscle protein synthesis, at least for a pe period of time, can actually go up. And so it's a little bit different than just stopping the muscle from being used as opposed to removing innervation from it. And so it could have something to do at least with the context of the, the synergist ablation and denervation studies have something to do with the, the, the denervation aspect of it as well. Um, and other studies that have used, for instance, um, testosterone uh, to, to induce hypertrophy and then taking the testosterone away uh, that is also different than loading um, the muscle 
perhaps via resistance training. Um, so that's one aspect, but also if you look closely at those studies, there is a reduction in the number of myonuclei after the removal of testosterone. Um, perhaps uh, it wasn't tested statistically in the way that um, it, it looks in the paper, but there was seemingly a reduction in the number of myonuclei. So there actually is evidence from that as well that myonuclei are perhaps being lost. Um, I think a lot of it is model specific and it may even be fiber type specific, which is actually what we, our follow-up paper to the one I presented is looking at fiber type specificity as well. So we'll have some answers to that, um, hopefully in the literature pretty soon. And so uh, there's a lot of different aspects to that question. I think there's, um, uh, it's, it's gonna be an ongoing learning experience from labs across the world, I think, moving forward. Um, I think though that the number of myonuclei from the short term may present a memory, maybe a memory for maybe less a few months or whatever, but perhaps after that there's other mechanisms such as DNA methylation, histone modifications, um, even microRNAs that could explain um, a muscle memory mechanism that's perhaps unrelated to the number of myonuclei. But I think there's going to be a lot more evidence coming out in the near future that will address that. And um, I think we're going to learn a lot in the coming years. So uh, that's, I guess, my, my summary. <laughs> Thank you, um, Alex, and thank you, uh, Kevin. Both, you know, great question and comprehensive answer. Uh, we've got time for at least one more. Uh, we've got Megan um, has got a question. Hi, great talk, gents. I was curious um, regarding muscle capillarization and muscle size. Um, could essentially the reverse be true, or what are your thoughts on that? And that could interventions to increase capillarization um, during muscle pathologies, cancer, cachexia, disuse, all the various ways muscle can get smaller, um, potentially help mitigate that muscle loss? Great question. It's a great question. Good to hear from you, Megan. Um, it's, it's complicated. So it's something that we're pursuing, at least in studies following like an acute orthopedic injury. I guess it gets a little bit more complicated when you bring cancer and cachexia into the fold and that you know, modulation of like vascular signaling proangiogenic factors might have conflicting effects on tumor progression per se. So it'd be something to try and balance out. But if these participants, if these patients were to undergo then a resistance training program, it may still represent a, a target to perhaps improve efficacy to that training and to hopefully stave off some of that muscle loss um, experienced by more kind of chronic illness. Um, it is something we're exploring further, but it's more related to the kind of atrophy you see after a knee injury per se um, within the quadriceps. But something I hope we can be able to, to shed some light on soon within that regard. But I, I do think that there would be applicability to more ter uh, chronic terms of illness, aging, um, things of that nature, where you do see kind of this, this uh, well-characterized muscle atrophy. Right. Thank you very much, guys. So just in the interest of time, I think we're, we're at a point where we're, we're wrapping up. So um, I just, uh, you know, for me to thank both, um, Chris and for Kevin for their time and a um, very interesting and great, great talk. And thanks to the audience for, good to see you, Kevin. Yeah, you did a good job. Thanks. Just with your shoulder uh, talking. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and thanks to the audience for their, their input. There's a few questions coming in now, but unfortunately um, we're, we're out of time. Just a quick note to say that we have um, Yave Gonzalez from the University of Bath, who's gonna do a talk on dietary sugar and exercise metabolism on the 8th of July, uh, around the same time, uh, 5 p.m. UK time. So if you're interested in that, please look out for the, the information on, on Twitter. Um, and that's, um, that's it from me tonight. Uh, I don't believe Nick has anything to add, um, but if he has, this is his last opportunity. So um, thanks again, Kevin and, um, and Chris, and I look forward to seeing more work coming out of your lab. Great, great stuff. Thank you, guys. Thank you.